Before we get started, let's talk about Pushkin Plus. Pushkin Plus is a subscription podcast program available on Apple Podcasts. Members will get access to exclusive bonus content, like my weekly bookmarks, where I talk about how I got a book agent and what I'm watching on TV that week. You'll get uninterrupted listening to many of your favorite podcasts, like Revisionist History, Cautionary Tales, and The Happiness Lab. Sign up for Pushkin Plus and Apple Podcast subscriptions. If growing up is painful for the Southern Black girl, being aware of her displacement is the rust on the razor that threatens the throat. It is an unnecessary insult. Everybody has a story. Like so many young people, I found mine in the words of Maya Angelou. Reading her autobiography made me care less about being likable. I felt more deserving. I wasn't sure of what exactly because I was 12, but I recognized the feelings of worthiness in her work. I know why The Cage Bird Sings wasn't just an autobiography. It was a testimony. I wanted to control my narrative, the way she controlled hers. I devoured her books to understand her audacity. Maya Angelou taught me how to be fearless, how to live with compassion, and most importantly, how to tell my story. Welcome to Well Read Black Girl, the literary kickback you didn't even know you needed. I'm your host, Glory Adam. For years, the Well Read Black Girl community has come together to honor the work of female, femme, and non binary writers of color. And now, we're inviting you to join the party. Each week, I'll be talking to writers, thinkers, and makers about how they found their voice, honed their craft, navigated the wild world of publishing, and showed up in the world. We move through the current cultural moment where art, justice, and literature collide and pay homage to the literary legacies of the women who paved the way. You'll hear from bookstore owners, literary advocates, and well-read Black Girl Book Club members themselves on what they're reading and what it means to be well-read. After the break, author and activist Tarana Burke and I discuss her childhood love for reading, how the Me Too movement led to her lifelong dream of writing, and how protecting your story can lead to freedom. But before she shares her story, please be aware that parts of this conversation allude to sexual abuse and trauma. Hi, I'm Sarana Burke, and you're listening to Well-Read Black Girl. Maya Angelou will always embody what it means to be a free, beautiful Black person. And Sarana Burke holds that same sense of freedom. Her work is compelling, unapologetic, but also super compassionate. As the founder of the Me Too movement, she aims to protect and liberate Black womanhood. Tarana Burke has become one of my heroes, sitting alongside Maya Angelou in my mind, and of course, on my bookshelf. She is part of a lineage of Black women who organize and take up issues that are impacting people who live on the margins. Her first book, Unbound, was released in September 2021 and tells her story from the very, very beginning. She's here today to share that beautiful story with us. Hi, how are you? How are you? 
I'm like all up in your background. I see the flowers. Ah, you look so beautiful. Yes, I tried to make it look like something in here. I'm so excited. Okay, before we fully, fully start, full disclosure, you are my first interview. Really? Oh, this is exciting. Yes, yes. Okay, so do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Tarana Burke, author of Unbound, my memoir, and You Are Your Best Thing, and founder of the Me Too movement. That was my first time introducing myself as an author, so I just want to say thank you for that. I've never done that before. Ooh, look at you. Congratulations, <laughs> Tarana, or, or should I say author Tarana Burke? Okay, okay, so let's get started. Was reading a big part of your childhood? Yeah, it's a big part of my childhood. I grew up in a house full of books, and I talk about this in my book a lot, but my mother was is an avid reader, voracious reader. And she read mostly literature by Black women. And so I read mostly literature by Black women, right? That was, was, I was like raised by Black feminist literature, I always say. It was the kind of thing where I had to do book reports even when school was out, right? My mother would give me book reports to do in the summertime. I also went to the library after school and, and my mother would actually take books from me as punishment. Like where other kids would be like, you can't watch TV. She's like, put those books down. <laughs> you know, like so. Yeah, I, I definitely, I loved, loved, loved reading. It was just my escape. You know, like most people, it was a, it was an escape. My grandfather introduced political literature to me. He literally saw me reading Roots one day, and he was like, "Oh, oh, you ready? Oh, you reading Roots? So you ready?" And he just like opened up a floodgate of. Of political literature. So between the two of those things, it was, yeah, that's how I grew up. I can see little Toronto reading Roots. <laughs> it's, it's so amazing <laughs> to see how your journey has taken you to now publishing your own memoirs. Like you are on tour and your book <laughs> is out in the world. How does it feel? Uh, it depends on the day, but it's, it's a little bit generally of a surreal feeling. You know, a lot of amazing things have happened to me since Me Too went viral, right? I've been all around the world and gotten all kind of, you know, accolades and met all kind of people. But the only thing that has happened to me that was actually something that was a goal in my life was to write. So the ability to, you know, get a book deal, have somebody say, we are interested in your life. We want to know your story. Especially since young Toronto was like, I'm going to be like Maya Angela. I'm going to write a whole bunch of books about my life. And yeah, I'm like, am, am I an author? It's hard to even call myself that. I, as though that's the thing I've always wanted to be. I'm like, oh, I'm an author. Ooh. You're an author. <laughs> yeah, you are an author. Embrace it. Oh, Embrace it. It's crazy. I mean, I love to hear that connection with my Angela because that connection is so, so deep for me as well. I think she, for so many young Black girls and women, is just like the icon, you know, she's the first one to do it with such transparency and vulnerability. And you address that in your book, how she inspired you in so many ways. Can you talk about the first time you encountered her work and what that that felt like? Well, the first time was in my mother's house, right? My mother had her first editions just by virtue of buying them when they came out. Those first few books that had like the rainbow and, uh, you know, remember that? That's why I was drawn to her initially. Because her books were pretty. (laughs) And I was 12. You know, I was like 11, 12 years old. I was just like, oh, I want to read these pretty books. And then when I read her work, I read I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings um, when I was about 12. And I encountered her story. And it was so similar to mine in some ways when her being, you know, sexually assaulted at such a young age. I was like, oh, well, this is my best friend, (laughs) you know? And, you know, when I think about it now, I, I don't know that I knew that she was a real person. Right. I don't mm. think until I got to maybe high school or right before high school, like I realized she's a living, this is her life. You know what I mean? Like I connected it yeah. as her. She was just a character to me, you know, like as she was a character yeah. that I loved. Um, and then when I discovered she was real, I was like, oh, this is the most magical person in the whole wide world. Right. You know, she's just amazing. That is so amazing because I read the book around uh, that same age, too. I was like probably 12 or maybe 11. And I really connected to the relationship she had with her brother, Mm -hmm. you know. So there's so many ways that you connect with her story. But this was her real life. Her real life. Right. It's crazy. It's so wild. But also like the bluest eye and Seeley, like those are fictional characters, but 
they also felt very reminiscent. It's like they're they're like a, a trio, a sisterhood. Yeah. All three of these young, beautiful black girls. Yeah, we know what they look like because of the descriptions in the book. And so these are black girls that either feel like you or you know them. You know mm-hmm. somebody like them, right? They just felt very familiar and opposite of what we saw on TV. And I love all these characters that allow us to see ourselves, but also see ourselves like in a beautiful, full way. Like we can be complicated, we can be messy, we can just be vulnerable. And I think that's like the through line throughout your entire book, Unbound, that came out in September 2021. It's all about vulnerability. And I wanted to talk to you about that headspace you were in because memoirs are a really, really difficult task, but Mm -hmm. you did it. And you did it so well, so <laughs> well done. Um, but but how were you able to not only like relive these like dark moments in your past, but do it with such authenticity and just courage? You know, some of the the writing in the book are built on writing that I did like years ago, right? Thinking I just need to get this out and get it down. I used to have a blog. Um a writing blog, uh, my girlfriend, you know, Imani Perry, who yes. is just, she's, I can't, she's a literary angel. But um, the first piece of advice she gave me was to write down everything that I remember from childhood to now, like every mm-hmm. significant memory, not not details about it, but just like a line, which was such a useful exercise. It took me forever But it was such a useful exercise because it started jogging my memories. One memory would spark another one. And then I went through and I collected every bit of writing that I had ever done that was remotely personal, that talked about life or that maybe connected to one of those memories. And I started off with all of that. And so Imani helped me initially create a not a timeline, but something in in the vein of a timeline so that I could pull out what felt relevant and create the arc of the story. Then the pandemic hit. <laughs> so so my headspace was like shut down. So I, I didn't write a ton in the first part of 2020. I just had so much anxiety and what have you. Um, the bulk of this book was written between September and this past March, which is why this is sort of a whirlwind too, because I had to keep coming in and out of... Um, this particular place that I needed to go in order to write, but I couldn't stay there because it was, it was, sometimes it was painful. Sometimes it was just, you know, it was, I had all these ranges of emotions that I didn't want to live in and live with Mm -hmm. every single day. So I'd write for like a week straight, just churn it out. And then I wouldn't write anything for like another week, much to the chagrin of my editors, but you know, that's the only way I could get it done. Well, you know, it's such an interesting thing because I was talking to Ashley C. Ford and she recently yes. finished her memoir. And she said, if you're writing a memoir, you need to have a therapy session twice a week, if not mm-hmm. more, because, you know, you find yourself in these memories and putting it down on paper. You are reliving them. Yeah. Um Another part of that reliving is healing. So you do Mm -hmm. share your healing and how you were able to just kind of have more clarity about who you are and what your story is. So what do you think you learned the most as you were writing the memoir? You know, there was there was a humbling and that's the best word I can think of at the moment um, that happened in this writing process for me. And I came into it thinking well, it's my life, right? I fought to make sure I wrote my book. I, I, I had This is my second deal. And I actually walked away from the first one because they wanted me to have a ghostwriter. And I was like, one, I'm a writer. Right. Two, I am not, who's, I'm not having my life ghostwritten, right? Like, so I was determined to do it myself, even though I didn't know at all how to write a book. <laughs> and it's so hard. <laughs> it's, um, and so I came into it thinking, I know my life story. I'm the, you know, the only expert on my life story, but there are different parts of us. And so there was a part of me that held on to a story that I thought I needed to tell. Mm-hmm. And then there was another part of me that was like, that's not the whole story, sis. <laughs> like, if you, you know, like you, that other part of me sits quietly in the corner and minds his business. And then they were like, well, if you're going to wake it up, then we're going to tell the story, you know? And it was humbling to have to like face some of these things that I thought I had worked through or that I had figured out. Or sometimes I was writing things and I'd I'd be like, oh shoot, that's not what happened. 
That's not what happened. Like I've been telling myself it happened this way for so long. Or even when I, I talk to friends to try to be like, oh, remember that time when such and such and such? Do you remember that? And they tell the story and I'd say, oh, wait, that's how you remember it? I thought it was, right. you know, it was, that was really humbling. Like, okay, okay. <laughs> It's like you have to reframe in your mind, like, like what really, what's my truth, you know? What's my truth? Yeah. You know, and I was so committed to like, I want to tell what happened, but like the, the version of like what happened that we keep is for our safety. Mm. You know, that's, that's one of the things I certainly learned. I had a version of things that happened to me that it, it's true, but it protects you from the full story. Um, even the story, I had, I had written down a story when I was first assaulted at seven a long time ago. Mm-hmm. And I'd worked out some years before that this narrative that I told myself that what my abuser said to me probably didn't happen. Like, he probably mm-hmm. didn't say those words. And I think I had told myself that he said, like, this is what happens to ugly little girls. Um, I don't really have a memory of that. I think I created that memory and inserted it in the story at some point to justify other beliefs that I had about myself. And I had worked out in therapy that that probably didn't happen. But when I was writing the story, it kept coming to me like, you forgot to add that. And I was like, I, you don't actually, I had to like say, like, you don't actually remember that. <laughs> like, I don't want to wow. add something here that's that's not true. And if it is true, and I'm still shaky about it. I just let it, you know, and I think I wrote in the book, I'm not sure what he said, but this is what I know. Those were the kind of moments where I was like, okay, when I put this down, I'm not going to write for a week. <laughs> no, they, it was hard. Yeah, because essentially what you're doing is you're talking to your seven-year-old self. And it, now that you have the, the space and the reflection, what would you say to her now, you know, as an adult, and you know all the things that you've encountered in your life, what would you turn around to say to seven-year-old Tarana? Well, it's what I had to say when I was writing, that you're okay. You're safe. What happened to you is horrible, and but we're going to get through it, right? Like, I think what was happening when I was writing is that seven-year-old Tarana was fighting. Like, don't, don't tell, not don't tell the truth, like tell a lie, but don't say that. You know what I mean? Like, there was a part of me, um, and, and it's not just seven-year-old Tarana inside Toronto that's been protective of outside Toronto for a long time. It's like, don't say that. We don't talk about this. You know, even in the beginning when I was talking about, you know, the way people think about me and how, how they think, you know, people who think you're ugly or that story about the man calling me ugly was the most difficult chapter. I'd actually written that as an essay, a really short essay some years prior and never really that many people read it. Um, but it felt necessary to include because there was some part, there's some part of me that also wanted to talk about the compounded reality of being a black girl in America. Mm -hmm. There is the way the world perceives you and make sure that you know that they perceive you that way. There is the internalized oppression that we deal with and that the repercussions of that, that we deal with from people in our own community. And then Mm -hmm. if there's abuse, there's the, the, you know, the trauma from that abuse. If there, there's poverty, there's the trauma from that poverty. Like, I want to paint a full picture um, because we don't see Black girls' humanity in its fullness often enough, I think. I'm Glory Edom. This is Well Read Black Girl. Today, I'm speaking with Tarana Burke about her recent memoir, Unbound. Tarana, what made you decide to share at this moment, especially when it comes to being so public about your life? Because you've been writing for a really long time. So what is it about this moment in particular that felt so necessary to tell your story? I think the timing is more or less, you know, related to how long it took me to write the book. But it still was important now because the movement is only getting bigger. And as it gets bigger, 
people take the liberty to try to define it and and or use it for their own purposes or distort it. And I wanted it to be on record, right? That this is the origins and this is where it comes from. And this is the, the reason why, like this is inextricably linked to black girlhood and you can't remove that no matter what you do. So at some point I just knew I needed to have that down. I, I thought it was important that it was recorded for future generations, for whoever's looking at, you know, the history of this movement, that this existed for these reasons, no matter what anybody else tells you. I'm I'm so I'm so happy to hear you say that because I think that it's so essential to correct the historical record and to have our voices out there in the public sphere and not to do it timidly. I, I know we're almost at time. I absolutely love the title of the book and I wanted to know how you came up with the title Unbound and what it means to you. So so I um, one of the people who helped me edit the book was uh, Garrett Kennedy. He's a writer. Uh, he used to be a writer for the LA Times. He has a, he's a, oh, yeah, he wrote the NWA book. He wrote the NWA right? book to, and he has yes, a book coming out. Garrett. Yes. He has a book coming out about Whitney Houston in February. Um, but Garrick was my personal editor. So I had my, every, everybody, every black writer I knew told me, get you another editor. <laughs> so that you, like you have a black editor if you don't have one. And I love my editor. Bryn at Flatiron is great. She was an amazing to work with. But Garrick was my like sort of writing coach and 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 I would send him my work to edit. Garrick is actually who came up with the title. So mm-hmm. I had another title in mind and I was desperate to find another one. And we do this sometimes. We like, we're going to figure it out in 10 minutes. Let's go. And we knew we wanted like one word. And so we were going back and forth. And I know this is a dramatic story, but this is really how it happened. I was sitting in his house and he turned to me. He was like, Unbound. And I said, oh my God, that's it. That's it. I, I just got chill. I mean, it you was said literally it like I- that. And he looked, <laughs> he said, unbound. And I was just like, I got that same feeling. I was like, oh my God, that's it. That's it. That is the that is the word. That is the title. And it just captured all of that for me. You know, like this is about us unbinding ourselves from these various things that tie us down, that keep us from growing and moving forward and feeling freedom. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was, I love him so much and I love him for that. <laughs> He's an incredible writer and that he title, it, it perfectly describes your experience. And now I'm thinking about, you know, you are an author, you're a writer, you're all the things. So what does the future hold? Like, will there be more memoirs <laughs> will you write about like the the movement like i feel like there's so much yeah. so much for you to give and i know it's a lot let me tell you so the the you know when you you've been through this process so you have two books you know when you're in those meetings the marketing meetings when they're when they're right before oh, yeah. you launch right and um they were introducing some new assets that were going to go out into social media what have you and the assets said um unbound the first memoir by Toronto Burke. And I was like, who told y'all to put that on me? (laughs) They were manifesting for you. They were manifesting. They said, oh, this is not going to be the the last. So in my mind, I remember joking with with Garrick and some of my friends and saying like, are they crazy? I'm not doing this again. But you know what? I want to write a novel uh, at some point in my life. So that has just always been a dream. I at some point, I plan on doing that. Um, there is more writing coming. That's that's the short answer. I've been getting a lot of requests to have a version of the book or something for young adults, um, which I really want to do because fifty percent of the book is about me as a young adult, right? And or a young person, and um, and I just don't think we talk about or talk to young people directly enough about this as a phenomenon that happens in their lives regularly. So I'm definitely thinking about that. And I feel like there's a part two bubbling up in my spirit, but we'll see. (laughs) I see it too. And there's so much more life to be lived and stories. Like I, I want everything that you left on the cutting room floor, bring it to us. us. And I cannot wait for a novel. I like that. That's going to be, we'll bring you back for another episode. Cause I want to hear 
the fiction, yeah, is it science fiction? Is it, you know, what, what do well, you think? It's, it's you probably going to be historical fiction, the book that's been brewing in my spirit during the quarantine uh, part of the pandemic. I started doing, I got really heavy into my family research, and I mm-hmm. have discovered an ancestor who I'm madly in love with. And I just, I'm doing more research on her now. So I feel like I want to fictionalize and tell her story, sort of fill in the blanks in her story. So. Girl, we'll oh, see. that's so incredible! From you know, just all the things. I'm so crossed. excited for you. <laughs> it's all it's all gonna happen. It's all gonna be happening. And we're gonna be here supporting. Well, oh I, my goodness! I appreciate it. Okay, Tarana, I wanted to play a game that I like to call Rapid Fire. <laughs> pew, 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 pew. Okay, I love those. <laughs> Where I ask you questions, and I want to hear the okay. first thing that comes to your mind. As long as you don't ask me my favorite book, because that'll be terrible. <laughs> you know what? We're not going to go there. We, we're going to start off with some fun ones. What's your theme song? Can't Keep a Good Woman Down by Mary J. Blige. There you go. I like that one. Okay, coffee or tea? Tea. Name three of the favorite things on your desk. Oh, I have a sign that says, stupid people get on my nerves. <laughs> That my daughter bought me, my gold stapler, which I really love, and my uh, moleskin. Okay. What's your favorite piece of clothing that makes you feel powerful? Oh, powerful. Mmm. I have a blouse that has these really, this black blouse that has a bow and it has these big puffy sleeves. And years ago, I took my license pictures, the best driver's license picture I ever took. <laughs> it's like, I love this blouse. So. I love it. <laughs> Uh, do you have a mantra, something you recite before giving a speech? I don't know that I have a mantra, but I, that quote by Cornel West is one that I refer to often. You, you can't lead the people if you don't love the people, and you can't save the people if you don't serve the people. Perfection. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so last two, what's your sign, and do you know your rising moon and sun? Oh, absolutely. My sun sign is Virgo. My rising is also Virgo. And my moon is in Ooh, Pisces. Two Virgos. I'm a triple Virgo because my Mercury is in Virgo, which rules are. That's our ruling planet. So I am all Virgo everything. <laughs> Virgos unite. That's right. <laughs> oh, I love that. Okay. And the last one is a special one for us. What does it mean to you to be well read? Oh, Oh, well, it means everything. I think that I would not be able to write well without being well-read. I wouldn't be able to, like, show up in the world the way that I'm able to show up if I wasn't well-read. And I think it means having um, books in your life that provide you guidance, that provide you levity, that provide you escape, but that, that really are sort of help you just grow as a person. And those books happen to be for me, mostly by Black women authors, but several others, you know, I, I love some Black men's too. So yeah, I, I take pride in being well-read. It was, you know, I don't think I would have advanced in life without having books, for sure. You know, I love this platform. I love Well-Read Black Girl. I love everything that you're doing because I remember oh, the first you. time I saw the name, I was like, that's me. <laughs> I'm a Well-Read Black Girl. You know, yes, it's, yes. It, it feels like a club. You know? It really, it really doesn't. Even with everything that's going on with the pandemic, even though we can't like meet in person, I'm still like, you know, this is our creative church. This is our family reunion. Whether we're in person or virtual, the love and energy is always there. Um, and I'm so grateful that you're like my first person. Oh, I said, man, well, Oprah, I'm so honored. Be okay. <laughs> <laughs> I said, please let let Mama O give us give us the, the thumbs up. Yes, indeed. Yay. Thank you so much, Toronto. Thank you for everything. Like, Thank you, sis. I'm giving you a virtual, virtual hugs, hugs, doing the Sealy hand clap. Yes. Congratulations. Toronto Burke is living proof that there are no defined boundaries to being an activist or an author. She shows us how activism can come in many forms and how your own story can serve as a catalyst. Her courage to open up about her past allows us to reckon with our own. Like Maya Angelou's, Tarana's memoir is enduring. It calls out to us to be clear about our identities and what we care about, what we stand for. I hope their stories are more than inspiring to you 
and move you towards action. Toronto's book, Unbound, My Story of Liberation and the Birth of the Me Too Movement is out now. After the break, we're taking a trip to one of my favorite bookstores in Washington, D.C. to see what they're excited to read this year. Here at Well Read Black Girl, we love a local bookstore. So of course, I've got to shine a light on some of my faves. From time to time, I'll check in with bookstore owners about why they open their shops and see if they have any staff picks for us. On today's Indie First, we're checking in with the owners at Sankofa Bookstore in Washington, D.C. Hey, Shrikiana, how are you? Thank you for joining us today. Can you tell us a little bit about Sankofa and your background? Sure. Shrikiana Garima is my name. I own with Haile, my husband, Haile Garima, Sankofa Video and Bookstore. We're located in Washington, D.C., Chocolate City. And we had intended to use the building to produce our films and maybe sell them as well as other films by African filmmakers uh, and other filmmakers of color. So we saw this space and highly, my husband just looked at it and said, you know, we should just have a bookstore here as well. And it is now 25 years. That is so amazing. Um, And as I said before, Sankofa holds a special place in my heart because of my experience at Howard and just reading like so much in, in your bookstore and learning so much about myself. So thank you. And you're gonna share some staff picks with us, right? What are you guys reading at Sankofa right now? I'm excited to share titles that are coming down the pike um, in 2022 based on staff recommendations. Hi, my name is Michaela, and the book I recommend is called Memphis. It's an upcoming novel by Tara M. Stringfellow, and I'm really excited about it because I'm from Memphis and I love reading about my hometown. My name is Jonathan. I'd like to recommend the book of Blood and Sweat. Black Lives and the Genesis of White Power and Wealth by Clyde W. Ford. It takes a very interesting approach in telling the story of the accumulation of white wealth in America through Black labor. Hi, I'm Christina, and the book I recommend is Black Love Matters by Jessica P. Pride. I'm excited about this book because Black love is grossly underrepresented in the media, and this anthology promises new thoughts and ideas on Black love in media representation. I can't wait to read it. Thank you again to Toronto Burke. It's been amazing to witness your growth and transformation. Congratulations, you are an author and an inspiration. I also have to give a special ancestral shout out to the light from above, Maya Angelou. Thank you so much for your words, your wisdom. We love you. Thank you all for joining me. This season, I'll be talking with authors like Gabrielle Union, Elizabeth Acevedo, Anita Hill. I mean, those are just a few names. Next episode, I'll be talking to Min Jin Lee, the author of Pachinko and Free Food for Millionaires about her upcoming memoir and her radical thoughts on why young people should be reading. And that episode's actually out now, so let it roll. So until next time on Well Read Black Girl, tell your friends to tell their friends so we can all be friends. Well Read Black Girl is a production of Pushkin Industries. It is written and hosted by me, Glory Edom, and produced by Cher Vincent and Brittany Brown. Our associate editor is Keisha Williams. Our engineer is Amanda K. Wang. And our showrunner is Sasha Mathias. Special thanks this week to Vicki Merrick. Our executive producers are Mia Lobel and Lee Tall Molad. At Pushkin, thanks to Heather Fain, Carly Migliori, Julia Barton, John Schnars, and Jacob Weisberg. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at WellRedBlackGirl. 
You can find Pushkin on all social media platforms at Pushkin Pods. And you can sign up for our newsletter at pushkin.fm. If you love this show and others from Pushkin Industries, consider subscribing to Pushkin Plus. Pushkin Plus is a podcast subscription that offers bonus content and uninterrupted listening for $4.99 a month. Look for Pushkin Plus on Apple Podcast subscriptions. And if you're already a subscriber, make sure to check out my exclusive bookmark series on Pushkin Plus starting on February 18th. You'll hear extended interviews with book club members, bookstore owners, and more. And you get to hear what's on my mind, what's on my radar, and of course, what's on my reading list each week. To find more Pushkin podcasts, listen on iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you like to listen.